What's up YouTube fam, Robbie C here today. We're out at Shadow Lake Disc Golf Course and hopefully there's not a shadow hole we're trying to cover today because we are trying to lift that shadow and talk about how to play courses blind. But before we dive into the video, we have to ask an important question. How are you doing today, Joey? Are you having a good one? So catch me if I fall. What do we mean when we say that we're playing the course blind? I'm not talking about closing your eyes and running around trying to play the course as if we were playing challenge disc golf content videos. Playing a course blind simply means that you're playing it for the first time and you may or may not be aware of the lines that exist. When would I play a course blind? Well, obviously if I'm playing for the first time casually and I wanna go check out a new course in my area or if I'm traveling, finding a course that I've never been to before could be a common option. However, lots of people are gonna end up playing courses blind and most of you who are probably watching this video are going to be playing a tournament and you don't know what you're to expect out of the course that you're playing for that event. Maybe you don't have the chance to get there and play a couple practice rounds on the course or you're showing up day of. Whatever the case may be, I wanna give you just a few tips that you can use to hopefully maximize your ability to score while playing a course for the first time. These are my personal rules that I like to play by, but if there are any that you have that you don't see mentioned in this video, feel free to leave them in the comments below. All right, so our principles when it comes to playing a course blind. The first rule and the one that you've heard me talk about on the channel before is asking the question, is this camera crooked? Yeah, that's better. But honestly, a terrible question when playing courses blind. The real question you should be asking yourself is what is the most obvious line that this hole is asking me to play? I'm going to take these factors into consideration and ask myself, do I have the shot that is being asked of me? Looking at this, it is 200 feet dead straight. Now, what options do I have to consider? I'll take the distance into account first. 200 feet, it is very flat, not uphill, no elevation change happening here. So at 200 feet, what am I throwing? I don't need to adjust a faster disc because it's uphill. I don't need to throw a slower disc because it's downhill, which means I'm probably throwing a putter. So I then can look at the three basic lines. I can look at going up the right side with a hyzer. I can go up the left side with either a turnover or a forehand, or I can go right at it straight up the gut. These are the three traditional options that I need to be looking at when I address any hole. And let's go ahead and eliminate the turnover or forehand option because really the only tree that should be coming into play on this fairway is on the left side. So if I push the forehand into that left side, I'm going to crash into that and it's going to cause the distance to be a little tricky. And if I try to avoid that tree, I'm going to push it too straight and on a forehand or a turnover, it's then going to bring this cart path over to the right into play as well. Now, that leaves the straight shot and the backhand hyzer. With the straight shot, I have the opportunity to throw a pole cap, most likely, and just push it right at it. I can do a hyzer flip with this and go dead straight, but the issue with trying to throw a straight shot, because the straight shot for many is the hardest shot in the game, is let's say that I try to go with a hyzer flip straight shot, and I don't put enough power into the shot or I put too much hyzer, now I'm fading left. If I put not enough and I throw it too flat and it's a flippy disc that's supposed to hyzer flip, it's gonna turn over bringing the cart path into play once again. Now let's say I don't go with a flippy disc and I just go with something that's a little more neutral and I try to rip it straight at it. With the wind existing, we're right next to the water so there's traditionally going to be more wind. I could have this thing turn over on me. I could have the wind come right to left and accidentally get underneath it at all and push it. The stray shot's just really hard, which means that there really is one place in my mind and that is the stock hyzer. The hyzer is the most reliable shot in the game. If I throw a overstable disc on hyzer out over this cart path, I know that even if I grip lock it and throw it all the way over it to that pad, because I threw an overstable disc on hyzer, which really wants to get moving in the direction of the spin that I'm putting on it, it's gonna get back there every time. Really, all I should have to worry about is just the distance and throwing my distance accurately and correctly. Even if it goes too far left, that's fine. It's gonna take the right side out of play. Analyzing these factors and telling myself that the play that this hole is asking me to throw is the hyzer, that's exactly what we're gonna do. If I'd never seen this hole before, I know that is the shot that they want me to throw, and I know that I can throw that shot. See, I even hung it too right for my own good, but because I threw an overstable disc on hyzer, it got out there and I put it too far right, but it still made its way back. I chose the right disc on the preferred line of the hole, and therefore we're giving ourselves a chance for a birdie. 
Now, obviously this is a more simple or straightforward hole. So I wanna make sure that I understand that these same rules and concepts can apply while I am out here playing more complicated holes. I'm going to simply ask the question, what is the shot, what is the throw that the course designer is asking me to throw here? Take that information, I process what I have the ability to do, and therefore I'm going to throw that shot. Let's say for instance on this exact same hole that I am a left-handed player and I don't have that big of a forehand or the turnover to play this safe hyzer on the right side of the hole. Well, in that case, the next highest percentage shot that I probably have is the straight shot. And that's the one that I should go with because if I can't throw the preferred line, then I need to keep walking down and finding the match of the highest percentage shot that I can throw along with the highest percentage shot that the hole has. And the more you play, the more you're going to find that answer for yourself. Rule two is one that I think should be considered more often than people give it credit for, especially when you're playing a course blind. And rule two is quite simply, throw where you can see. This hole comes in at 244 feet and you can see the basket. There's two baskets probably in frame, but the one on the right is the one we're playing to. I have a fenced off area over to my right, as well as a ton of woods that I have no idea how dense or thick they actually are. So the backhand hyzer, obviously for right-handed players, is off the table. I can go with a straight shot right at it, or I can go with the big open hyzer coming in from the left side on a forehand. At 244 feet, I have three options. I've got my pig as the first option, throwing a nice safe forehand, but even though this thing says 244, it plays pretty uphill, which means that it's gonna play more like a 280, which can make me wanna jump up to a justice that I know I can put more power behind and still trust that it's gonna fade back at the end of the day, or I can disc all the way up to a felon and guarantee that I can get there. However, embracing rule two, which is throw where I can see, I have to understand that all of these shots I'm trying to throw are moving left to right. The pig is going to be the straightest option, which means that if it decides to not fade while putting power behind it because I need a little more juice on it to get it there, it's going to hold straight. And the most open part of this hole seems to be straight into the left of the basket. If I throw the justice, I know that I can put more power on it, but my justice usually gets a decent amount of ground action and actually skips a decent amount. If I don't start it far enough out to the left, it's definitely going to get right, which could crash me into the woods. And because I'm playing this blind and don't know what to expect in those woods, it could easily take me from having a simple two look or even a easy three to a complicated scramble where I'm struggling to get my three. The same thing goes with the felon, which I know is gonna have more than enough power for me to get there, but if I come off of it and have to throw it too soft, then that could cause me to let it flex into the woods based on the nine speed overtaking it and the overstability crashing me into the woods, same scenario as the justice, or I could juice it, put it into the tree that's straight ahead and behind the basket, or even I could go past the basket and I have quite simply no idea what's behind there. So because of those reasons, I'm actually going to drop both of these and I'm going to throw the pig here. Now, at 244, playing like 280, I should be able to get my pig here. But one of the biggest things that I have to understand when playing a course blind is that I am definitely not trying to attack every single hole. If I'm playing blind, I have to accept that par is what the course thinks I should take. And if I'm playing blind, it's simply my intuition versus the course. All right, I landed out left of the basket, but it looks like I'm gonna be short. We'll see how the ceiling comes into play on this. All right, so this is super interesting because I am, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, about 25 feet away from the basket, which is a putt that traditionally I should feel pretty confident making. However, this branch right in front of me is definitely in my way. Opportunities like this where I am more of a push putt and I need the ceiling to be able to make a play at the basket are exactly why I spent time with this video trying to learn the spin putt, especially at these shorter ranges so that I could pull different putting tools out of my toolbox. So let's see if we can put the spin putt to work. Wow, that actually felt pretty good. That looks good. 
You notice I had to go with that because if I go with my traditional push, for me to give it the height for it to carry into the basket, this is definitely in the way. Thankfully, we put in some decent time on the putting green with our spin putt and we were able to convert on the birdie there. However, if I didn't have that tool in my toolbox, simply making a decision off the tee and throwing where I could see allows me an easy par because if I don't have that tool and it drops down right there, I'm simply walking up and closing out the hole with my three and walking away. In hindsight, if I would have pushed it a little more straight or even gone a faster disc, landing over here in this open space actually removes the ceiling and I can go really far away from the basket and still have the opportunity to hit a putt or miss a putt with wide open space. Throwing where you can see is going to create some safe opportunities if you execute the shot you want, but we have to understand once again that it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to get the birdie that I'm looking for every time. And that's okay because we shouldn't be looking for birdies every time, especially when we're playing courses blind. But a situation like this, throwing where I can see really pairs well with rule three to take my game to that next level when playing these courses blind. The third rule that I want you to focus on when playing a course blind kind of builds on rule two, which is to throw where you can see. Now this basket is off in the distance and it looks like it's on a sloped green. I could just throw into this, but because I don't know how sloped the green is, it might have the potential if I throw, let's say a hyzer, which according to rule one is looking at the most obvious line out there. What's to keep it from rolling up onto this path and rolling OB? I'm not quite sure. So it's gonna take a little more effort, but never be afraid to walk up and inspect the fairway while you're throwing. This hole is 218 feet, and because of that, I want to make sure that I'm trying to attack this hole. And if I were to only live by rule two and stop there, throwing to where I can see would have me land right here, I'd have to lay up the putt and be fine. But by walking up the fairway, I can see that yes, it's on a slope, but this slope isn't too extreme. And because of that, I have the ability to throw that shot and make an attack on this hole because I didn't leave it up to imagination. Just because we are playing a course blind does not mean that we have to play a course scared. And when we take the time to walk up and inspect the greens or inspect where we're trying to throw, that gives us the opportunity to adjust our plan and attack accordingly. Through the spike, checked into the hill. Now let's see how the birdie look is. As you can see, the slope is drastic when I'm past the basket, it does get a little more intense. So coming in short, knowing that it's gonna get a little forward ground action on this hill, allowed me to throw it short and allow it to get a little bit of forward momentum, scooting me on up to this basket. Now, playing a course blind, looking at it, instead of simply living by rule two and saying I can only throw where I wanna go, I looked at where I could see, I assessed the green by taking a few extra seconds to walk up and actually inspect where I'm throwing with the heat index. It's like 108 out here today. Whew. And because of that, I'm able to net a birdie on a course. And I wanna give a caveat here because lots of times if you're playing with kind local people, they'll give you insight into, oh, this is what line you should throw, watch out for this, blank, blank, blank. And those are factors that you can take into your consideration when throwing the shot, but there's nothing like trusting your own gut and getting up here and inspecting it. Another important rule for PDGA sanctioned event players is that yes, while technically walking up the fairway and inspecting what's going on should count into your 30 seconds. I know most folks won't actually count that until you get on the tee. So unless you're on all 18 holes, walking up and inspecting the green, most of the time your card mates are gonna be pretty okay with letting you evaluate it, especially if you let them know early on, hey, I'm playing this course blind, so take it easy on me. Another pro tip to save yourself the extra steps when you're walking is let's say you've got two holes that walk side by side, for instance, on holes two and three. This is the tee box of hole two, which plays up yonder in this direction. And I can see next tee sign is off to the right. And thankfully, this tee sign even lets me know that the basket to hole three is gonna be that basket right over here. So I can make a quick assumption looking at this hole that the woods on the left are not great. Seems to be open space over to the right because that's where the next fairway is. So I can keep that in my head but also to keep myself when I play hole three from having to walk all the way down and inspect the green again, 
I can look at hole three while I'm walking up the fairway of two and make some quick assessments on, okay, it's tucked pretty close to this wood line, so I'm gonna wanna send one past and get the uphill putt. This right gap is gonna feel a lot more favorable. You may be able to come in on the forehand gap of the left side, but those trees are a little more overgrown than the ones on the right side. By simply taking a few seconds to assess the green that I'm walking past, I'm going to save myself time, I'm going to save myself energy, and I'm going to get valuable information on playing the next hole correctly. Now these are just a few rules that you should consider while you're out there playing a course, especially when you're playing it blind. If I were to add two additional rules to this, the first would be one that we kind of mentioned in rule two, which is that when playing a course blind, you should understand that pars are completely acceptable. Playing a course blind for the first time is shooting some blazing hot round while cool is usually unlikely. So going out there, getting a good grasp on what holes you can attack later on when you come back to this course and making adjustments on your initial perceived game plan is huge to adapting to a course and becoming a better golfer overall. The second rule I would add, however, is that with a growth in disc golf YouTube, one thing that we've gained is a lot of coaches out there trying to tell you what you can and can't do, including this Mr. YouTube man right here. But also there are tons of channels out there of people posting challenge content because so many people are trying to make a career or take their disc golf hobby to the next level. I think that's amazing. And I love that disc golf YouTube continues to grow so that I continue to find new channels of people tagging me in the comments all the time of saying, hey, check out this video. Hey, I learned this tip from Robbie. Whatever it may be, I love getting to see your content while you're out there. But if you're traveling to play a course blind, so many courses in the areas that you are probably visiting have some YouTuber or some aspiring YouTuber out there who has created a video or content on the course that you're likely to play which means that you could possibly have some footage that you can look at to get an insight into the course and maybe give you some ideas or expectations for lines that you should look at when playing that course for the first time. Now, of course, my tip then goes to YouTubers creating content. Make sure that you're tagging the locations of the courses you're filming on because it does help people come alongside and see opportunities for them to use your footage for reviews for the course. If you're a tournament director, it's definitely worth checking out if you have a local YouTuber in your area, ask Asking them to maybe do a course preview or go out and film them playing the tournament layout could be an easy way for them to help you out and to get promotion for their channel. It's a win-win for both. Well, that being said, I hope this video is helpful. And like I said, if you have tips or rules that you follow in playing courses blind, I would love to hear them in the comments below so that the comments can continue to be a resource for people to come and learn later on. In the meantime, I want to say thank you so much for watching and thank you for checking this out. I hope you have an amazing rest of your day and please make it fantastic for someone else too. But for now, we're going to leave you with the birdie.